so the restaurants are closed and things like that. So it's a bit of a lockdown again. So the restaurants are closed and things like that. So it's a bit of a lockdown again. Great. <laughs> Hello. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to contribute. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, it's very nice to join again one of the AA visiting schools uh, because even though I'm now since two years in Hong Kong, before that I was uh, for a long time, as you mentioned, in AA and also um, doing several of the visiting schools. So it's nice to be part of that program. Um, I'll just jump in because it's kind of interesting. We're supposed to be uh, with the Shenzhen Visiting School and I'm in the neighboring area of Hong Kong. Um, so um, we're part of the Greater Bay Area, um, as it's called now. And until recently, this narrative around this area was very much about increasing uh, urban growth, continuous expanding of uh, city areas and integration. Uh, kind of what Manuel de Landa calls meshwork cities, including economic development. Um, you know, my lectures usually are about social technology pro progress, um, economic growth through principles of concentration, interaction, and innovation. But, um, and then I, I show that uh, data-driven urbanism, the title of this lecture, is really about understanding um, the city as an ecosystem where architecture, urban design come together with also the possibilities of data-driven design and urban analytics. However, uh, of course, I have to mention briefly that uh, now we are in this a uh, new reality which brings up questions about um, cities and ever ongoing vulnerabilities, not just to 
uh, diseases for humans, but also for cities and how dependent they are on um, the economy of consumption and tourism, uh, on the supply lines from uh, hinterlands to provide food and other essential. In the age of pandemics, is maybe uh, starting to become different, uh, taking into account travel restrictions, social distancing, um, reframing uh, the way we now need to communicate and interact uh, both at the micro scale and also the macro scale. Um, sudden improvements in the air quality and other natural systems of course show a sort of positive note in the time of crisis. Um, but this also really shows the need for uh, urgent rethinking of how we think about urban systems in relation to the environment. Um, and uh, there's already people doing research about the impact of COVID-19, for instance, on urban mobility systems, where bicycling, for instance, is not just uh, something to reduce carbon emissions, but also it could lead to a more um, democratic access to neighborhood services by residents, improving the social character of public spaces as well. So urban planning um, might start to rethink, for instance, uh, using instead of centralized shopping malls um, where everyone come together and have the chance to uh, affect each other, uh, focusing rather on local neighborhood stores and restaurants which benefit uh, local communities, which is also good for, for instance, low income group, elderly people. Um, so this might actually be a positive thing in the longer term. Um, research show that urban density is not necessarily the main factor in spread of the virus, but actually points out that um, this shows the underlying issues of uh, the real sort of economic and uh, social structure of the city, for instance, how neighborhoods uh, that are home to poorer communities also have a lack of services uh, because the people there are less able to work from home. Um, they see um, higher infection rates, but this is not necessarily linked to density of buildings. So it's in relation to the social structures that we, uh, that these um, sort of entail. This is uh, sort of the key of my research. Um, the pandemic is bringing up um, deeper rooted questions about this, uh, but there are also um, ongoing questions that were anyway already addressed in my work. So I will show a range of examples uh, from both academic work, teaching with the students and uh, my office, uh, Urban Systems. First, going back to history a little bit. Um, if the question is, how can we design new cities or read the next one? Uh, can we actually design cities at all? The first point I want to make is that uh, if you look at the history of cities, they're, they're not really designed. They're, they're mostly grown organically through human activities uh, around things such as intersection points of travel routes, uh, where humans start commerce and trade, and then find specializations and collaborations. So um, cities like London, which really grown around crossing in the river, um, very much grown based around the principle of market economics, um, which of course has positive and negative sides. London also famous for, uh, in the Victorian times, um, these really squalid conditions, exploitation of labor, substandard and sanitary living conditions, and other you know, social problems, as uh, illustrated here by Gustave Dore in the 19th century. So the origins of city planning are really uh, coming out of this antidote for um, or trying to find a solution for the very unhygienic and slum-like conditions of cities that are grown out of uh, purely economic uh, mechanisms. Um, the Corbusier, of course, famously promoted the functional city planning principles as one of the cornerstones of modernist movement, um, really from sort of ideology of uh, public hygiene, quality of living by increasing access to daylight, clean air, ventilation, safe uh, spaces for 
uh, children playing, etc. Uh, so there are quite noble idealisms behind this, but then of course, again, um, this uh, kind of model for a very uh, repetitive and standardized uh, typology of buildings was maybe implemented too literally in many cases, and especially in Hong Kong, where there's a very strong legacy of uh, modernist movement and the town planning movement. Um, but if you compare it to the previous image, uh, buildings were placed with a much higher density. Um, so the quality of the in-between spaces is really much more under pressure. Um, you could argue that um, the modernist principles are really associated with industrial society and to understand where this comes from, we need to understand uh, the factors that drives this need for rational planning as a way to really streamline and optimize production processes. So housing, of course, is part of that uh, as, for instance, the public housing in Hong Kong was really conceived as a workers' housing and the rents were low to indirectly subsidize companies uh, to, po to pay really low salaries. Uh, so it was not conceived as a welfare system, but much more as a um, uh, infrastructure to boost the economy. Um, you could see that in the scale repetition and um, other kind of pattern making in the urban scale, there's almost a sort of panopticon principle of surveillance as well that you could argue is helping to instill a certain social order, which is uh, not always positive and might be perceived negative, for instance, by kids growing up in these kind of neighborhoods. Um, the urban planning contributes to a certain type of reproduction, not just reproduction of, of workers to feed the economic system, uh, but also beliefs, uh, ideas about uh, what people's role is within society. And again, there is a high degree of repetition in this all across Hong Kong, which you could argue is hopefully becoming obsolete when the industrial society is making place and getting replaced by a post-industrial society where uh, we're no longer going to standard um, companies working from nine to five or where um, industrial modes of manufacturing are being replaced by service economy and much more flexible modes of work. So there's, uh, of course, a lot of examples already uh, and trends that are ongoing, such as Google famously using a flexible office policy to let employees choose how and where they want to work, um, which actually increase productivity rather than these systems of discipline and, and hierarchy. Uh, we work showing the success of flexible co-working spaces, which are designed to feel a home away from home. And of course, homes, especially now in the pandemic, uh, become like um, workspaces as well. And this actually saves a lot of time for commuting and saves space um, to keep offices. Um, and also allows people more freedom, for instance, to combine work with childcare. Um, and public spaces becoming more hybrid, for instance, coffee shops being used as office space as well. Uh, shopping malls, no longer really about shopping, but more uh, center for community events, etc. You could argue digital technologies make obsolete this kind of separation from modernism uh, between living, working, recreation, uh, between public and private, as we now can work, shop, uh, socialize anywhere at any time, anyway. So again, um, this can have positive and negative consequences, uh, this blurring of work, live and play. Um, as maybe the entire city becomes a shopping mall or... Sorry, I run without the sound. Um, or uh, the public space and the experience of going through the city becomes kind of saturated with uh, sort of consumerist messaging and advertising. Um, so how do we think about this and respond to this? Um, Louis Mumford uh, 
uh, already in 1934 in his book, Technics and Civilization, wrote about the neo-technic age where humanity would no longer be obliged to adapt itself to the hard mechanical rhythm of the machines. Um, but a new type of soft machines will be introduced that adapt themselves to the dynamic flow of organic life. So you could argue that um, the current state of social media is already a form of augmented reality, which offers practical convenience in exchange for ever closer monitoring and merging of consumerist economy with everyday life. Uh, architecture as a choreography of spaces and activities is complicit, you might argue, uh, in creating these kind of crisis conditions, especially if architects contribute to the production of housing, for instance, only as a mechanism for investment driving economic growth rather than seeing housing as a basic human right or a strategy that cities can employ to provide a basic uh, quality of living. So for this video about young people living permanently in internet cafes in Japan shows this kind of crisis um, where also it is well known that uh, some young people in Japan do not even choose to date anymore because they cannot uh, deal with the prospect of having to have a successful career and marriage uh, in the way that is defined by society which becomes uh, too unaffordable for them. So you could argue that the basic principle of um, cities to support social human relationships is failing in these kind of scenarios. So this is a real product on sale now in Japan, which I find actually very alarming and it points to problems, um, not just with housing, but maybe in a larger sense in society. So how can we design solutions, for instance, for housing or new forms of domesticity in response to this kind of crises, um, not just the pandemic, but more long-term developments such as unaffordable rents, uh, cost of living, etc. Can we rethink, for instance, whether housing always needs to be private or can there be forms of sharing to increase the affordability? Uh, in London, this is already happening with companies such as the collective, for instance, marketing co-living to young professionals as a way to extend their social and professional networks. And um, our student, Woojin Kim, for instance, in the AA Intermediate 6, analyzed their building designs and proposed an even more radical version where the size and locations of the units can be adapted based on the resident's need and budget. So the shared spaces in the system become flexible as well, offering residents to choose when they want to share activities such as um, cooking or sleeping with a group of people, depending on their needs or budget. The shared spaces become flexible um, in a way that it is uh, self-organized. So um, this is a idea developed in an academic studio, but this also impacts, for instance, how um, we work in practice. Um, working with a client in China for a housing project with non-standard apartment configurations. We basically um, promoted um, that there is a business case to be made for developer to offer a greater mix of apartments. 
where a range of apartments can be classified according to privacy levels and processed through integrated Rhino, Grasshopper, um, to Revit, even a BIM model workflow. So this kind of setup allows for uh, changes to be made about which specific mix of apartments is being offered in the building to the market as the market uh, demands changing um, throughout the planning period or even throughout the lifespan of the building. Um, in Hong Kong, with another project, we started to imagine how this way of thinking can apply to the high-rise housing, which is even more optimized uh, than in China because of the high land prices, uh, regulations and construction costs in Hong Kong. There are different types in public housing available right now, but uh, as this student, uh, Kelvin Ma, analyzed, they're actually very similar in what Hilly and Hansen have described as a space depth, the level of privacy and the social relations that people can have as they are set up by the arrangement of the rooms. So this makes um, Hong Kong housing actually very inflexible for people who are not uh, in a standard nuclear family but have, for instance, different lifestyle requirements or co-living preferences or even live uh, and work um, preference such as work from home. So what Kelvin did was to set up a mechanism that takes different user requirements into account and then can vary the room sizes and spatial relationships of uh, typical apartment models. Um, the system would allow for individual requirements for one family or a group of residents and produce a range of options that can be evaluated, but then also helps to negotiate how different apartments can be combined on one floor. For instance, negotiating between uh, requirements for access to light and views, um, while minimizing the complexity of the floor plan, the access to the shared lift core at the center of the tower. So he set up a uh, multi-objective um, generative algorithm, which allows to evaluate and test different configurations, which would then visual, be visualized to the residents to allow them to decide which options they prefer. And he also developed a materialization system informed by the existing use of prefabricated elements. Separating a core, which would be fixed and a structural frame uh, from a discrete set of uh, modular spatial elements that could be assembled into different apartments configurations. So for different lifestyles, you could have different um, apartment configurations where you can see the space depth, uh, the hierarchy between rooms can be varied depending on the desired level of sharing or privacy for the different spaces. The tower as a whole would never be finished, but actually always be in the process of being reconfigured. So on the outside, it would reflect the dynamism of changing and evolving patterns of inhabitation. Um, by the residents. The use of uh, multi-objective optimization and visualization enables a kind of bottom-up process of decision-making using computational intelligence to strike a balance between the desires of the individuals and the interest of the collective. And the role of the architect then is transformed from that of a product designer to more of a process designer, very similar to how Nicholas Negroponte wrote about uh, soft architecture machines, um, having intelligent man and machine systems which are capable of producing an evolutionary system. So can these processes and ideas around housing, for instance, also be translated to the scale of urban design? Jumping back again to office projects, um, this is an example that blurs the distinction between architecture and urbanism. Um, as the basic principles about mixing activities and setting up relationships are pretty much the same at any scale, in our view, 
uh, for instance, when we designed this office tower um, to resemble a vertical village, stimulating social interaction between different offices across different floors. Even the small pavilion scale, uh, we can test these principles of um, a kind of data-driven urbanism and placemaking using, for instance, computational processes to understand the circulation and viewing lines, and then um, generating a series of play spaces with varying privacy levels uh, on the inside, uh, blocking the views from the surrounding, uh, in this case, uh, atrium of a shopping mall. So we can jump across scales and see how these principles translate. For instance, when we deal with an entire urban block, we still can have a range of housing typologies be guided by ideas about urban porosity, uh, sight lines, uh, creating privacy or openness in different parts of the site. In this case, for instance, we created first a series of um, urban block typologies based on courtyard principle, which then can also transform into a standard tower um, typology. And distributed across the site, we would then create in response to site conditions such as busy roads in the corners and the orientation to the sun, uh, we'd create a sort of gradient field of different courtyard conditions with a central garden space to which all residents have clear lines of sight. So um, the project has separate small living communities for the residents, but they're also visually connected to a central uh, group of facilities at the heart of the project. As the project was intended for mostly elderly residents, um, the emphasis was placed on active and passive recreation facilities to promote healthy aging, well-being through social interaction. So um, back in academic work, we continue this research around how circulation and lines of sight within housing affect the social interaction amongst residents, for instance, of public housing estates. Um, this project, for instance, analyzes the walkways and footbridges and whether these exert a certain sense of control or give a sense of freedom uh, to people when they're deciding how to move through the site. In this case of uh, Wosha State, which is analyzed by Tim Chow, there's actually a very central uh, corridor of elevated pedestrian walkways, which forces people kind of to take the same route every day, um, which is separated from social spaces. So it becomes very monofunctional and in that sense, um, antisocial almost. And there's other models which you can learn from precedents to organize these kind of networks in a way that creates more freedom of choice and also integrate public spaces, for instance, in people's daily commute, giving them a sense of uh, freedom about how and where and when to socialize with fellow residents. So this leads to another important principle in urban design, that of appropriation, or in other words, not designing everything, but actually leaving certain spaces open to local residents to do what they want. Uh, the same project by uh, Tim Chow, as mentioned, was developed along these lines and principles where he used the uh, space syntax principles of network connectivity and integration to, for instance, predict social interaction across public housing estates that would be um, re uh, redeveloped in Hong Kong in the coming years. So by designing a network with multiple options for passing through from one point to another, and also multiple options for occupying the public spaces, the project aims to offer residents new ways of using a podium as a kind of three-dimensional landscape yeah. for community activities that are not planned top down, but negotiated and organized by local residents themselves in a more spontaneous and flexible manner. So this very much follows the idea on the readings of um, the right to the city by Lefebvre and the idea of heterotopia by uh, Michel Foucault, which indicates the idea of um, 
spaces that are other or counter to what is the kind of status quo or what is considered to be normal or generic public space, but rather giving spaces over to subcultures to uh, temporary occupy a space and in that sense, engage in a dialogue with other groups within society. Uh, a good example of this idea of heterotopia is for instance in Hong Kong on Sunday where the domestic workers occupy the sidewalks and uh, they choose specifically sidewalks because the public parks have too many regulations about not allowing food and music and things like that. So um, we studied a lot this relationship between management and urban form and whether we can design systems that are not about control or celebrating uh, the companies or institutions that are around these kind of very central urban spaces in Hong Kong, but rather maybe these spaces are designed deliberately opaque, um, a bit messy, like a maze of different kind of opportunities for people to inhabit and appropriate uh, small pocket spaces, maybe different kind of seating, um, temporarily making this their home, um, showing off different cultures, not uh, divided in separate zones across the project, but deliberately organizing them in a way that stimulates people from different cultures to also come into contact with each other. So we're very interested in this idea of open frameworks uh, as a way to design and also not design how urban spaces and urban structures can develop over time and whether they have a certain um, ability for appropriation by subcultures. This student project, uh, again from a CUHK studio, was uh, actually at the location between the border and Hong Kong and Shenzhen at the Lok Ma Chao Loop. And it was inspired by the metabolist movement in Japan. Um, so it uses the idea of an inhabitable frame to loosely guide what different types of living, working and recreating can take place. Where the frame is kind of imagined as a subsidized infrastructure, making it easier for local residents to create startup companies or set up co-working, co-living spaces in a kind of self-organized way, um, where the only thing the architect decide, decide, decides uh, and designs is a kind of the void and the relationship to the landscape, for instance, to provide basic uh, amenities such as access to light, views, recreation, a public space, while letting the internal processes of the open framework be controlled by the residents, which are then also open to uh, flexibility, it changes over time. Uh, basically, going across a range of scales, can these principles of open framework even apply to the scale, the scope of a master plan, um, which maybe in a way a master plan is always uh, supposed to be an open framework where other stakeholders can come in and develop individual plots and decide on the function mix and activities. So in our office, um, we designed this master plan in uh, Changsha, um, also as a kind of open framework, um, but using generative design to try and script the zoning of a pub, uh, urban fabric and public spaces, creating a range of urban block types with different qualities of space, either having public space on the corners uh, or having internal courtyards and letting the um, urban fabric and spaces be generated from the public domain. Uh, the genetic algorithms were used to develop, classify, sort and deploy the different block types that would then be able to be deployed on site. So this kind of process allows for the automated generation of um, hundreds or even thousands of options and then calculate their spatial performance in relation to, for instance, sunlight analysis and other factors such as the plot density, the green ratio, et cetera. 
and then using a kind of um, special quality mapping onto the site, the software process would pick the right block typologies and place them onto the site, assembling a larger urban fabric with a sort of gradual changing range of urban qualities and densities and different relationship between public and private. Um, the function allocation would then actually allow, um, sorry, the function allocation would follow the possibilities and the analysis of the urban fabric as it is generated in the previous stage. Um, distributing and mixing different types of commercial spaces, uh, residential areas, and creating this kind of mixing zone in the middle where the different groups of people can meet and interact with each other. And the key of creating a kind of social structure, again, through this generative process, was to then also provide literally a platform in the center of the site where community activities, uh, commercial retail, but also recreation and cultural activities can take place. So finally, can we go even further when we arrive at this scale of reimagining entire parts of the city based on possibilities of generative design, urban analytics, and how data can drive our understanding of how users and the environment interact with each other. For instance, uh, development of self-driving cars and other ideas within the car industry signals a very interesting trend from that of um, product suppliers to service providers where car companies are moving towards subscription services and designing complete new systems um, based on ideas about how users communicate with vehicles, well, how they charge and what energy they use, uh, how this matches and, and slots into people's lifestyles. Self-driving cars allow for a combination of a lot of, uh, a range of activities of the everyday life with mobility. Hi, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Can you see my screen? Yeah. It's a pity I was getting to the closing arguments. Yes. So the self-driving cars don't need fixed lanes in the surface of the city um, marked by barriers, uh, traffic lights, zebra crossings, 
etc. But they could be operating in a flexible field because of the sensors that allow them to avoid pedestrians and adapt in a flexible sense to the supply and demand of groups of people in the public domain. And uh, this project by my student, uh, George Lau, took on Tun Mun in Hong Kong uh, as a case study, which is one of the new towns, which is entirely designed around uh, car infrastructure and also very heavily designed infrastructure for public transport. And what's very interesting, the original and the current land use maps show the transition from separate living and industrial areas to much more mixed kind of tapestry for uh, post-industrial activities. And this allows to rethink, for instance, the site as a Tun Mun town center, which is currently very much planned around traffic lights, um, stops for public transport, uh, barriers to give safety, but actually resulting in very narrow sidewalks for pedestrians and um, people having to go all the way around to try and get to other areas of the city. Uh, and this can now can be reimagined as a kind of um, open field of possibilities because the spaces occupied by the roads can be given back to the public. There may be some kind of uh, digital tra traffic control system which allows still slow moving vehicles into this territory, but at the same time prioritizes pedestrians and social activities. So the street becomes a much more dynamic, self-organized and a user-centric public domain where pop-up markets or food stalls or meeting rooms, temporary office space, are being allocated uh, through uh, apps on people's phones and a central brain that allocates spaces when and where they are needed. And maybe even at night, uh, this space becomes a space for dwelling where people are allowed to sleep in other kinds of vehicles as an alternative to the overpriced and difficult to access housing market of Hong Kong. So this um, is the kind of final image of the lecture showing the mixing of living, working, shopping and recreation as a kind of glimpse, uh, brainstorming exercise into a world of new possibilities when we engage with data-driven urbanism. There's a small video to conclude which shows some of the further consequences as uh, the students thought about when we introduce um, self-driving vehicles and rethink the public spaces in this new kinds of city. In the morning, food truck owners use the app to see which area has more commuters walking and therefore select a grid for selling breakfast. The system defines a street for commuters to walk through. Meanwhile, shared self-driving cars keep seeing the surroundings before moving. Mobile offices gather to have a team meeting at the start of the day. Residents practice Tai Chi in front of the mobile screen which also activates the plaza behind. In the afternoon, small shop owners reserve popular area outside shopping malls. Temporary streets and plaza are articulated with mobile shops and public seatings. Meanwhile, a manager meets his client on a mobile office that is driven to the client's place. The common ground also allows Dama singers to perform outside the park without confronting with other park users. At night, the common ground becomes the affordable home for residents. Thank you, that's, that's it.
Yes, no, it's been a, a, a nice presentation, yeah. Um, shall, shall I talk a bit about that? Can you hear me? Okay, it says my internet connection is unstable, so I'm a bit scared that I drop away again. Um, it's been really fun to move to Hong Kong because there are are a lot of interesting challenges here at a different scale from London. Of course, in London, we always looked at different parts of the world, uh, but here we can really visit and go very often to these kind of sites, which are very high density with very tall buildings and very uh, limited amounts of in-between space. So the pressure is more clear that there is a pressure to develop the very little available land that is actually flat in Hong Kong um, with as much housing as possible. So all the housing here is uh, at least 33 stories, 40 stories, 180 meter towers. Um, and then it's a completely different reality from being in London, for instance, and, and theoret uh, theorizing about these issues, um, when you can actually see that, obviously, um, there's a pressure as well on the uh, local residents, and you see uh, how small the apartments are and um, how stressed people are about the lack of public space uh, for basic needs. Uh, uh, public space is not just something that is a kind of a luxury for having fun, like so doing some recreational activities, but it becomes clear if you have a very small apartment or maybe even a big family in a small apartment that these spaces are very crucial for keeping a sort of uh, mental health and um, social network uh, especially for people that are elderly, for instance, um, otherwise very isolated in old buildings and old uh, blocks. So this is, it gives a more sort of a realistic sense to the work, but then of course, what I can bring from uh, having taught in London before is still uh, hopefully with the students working uh, uh, with them to sort of give them the opportunity to think outside of the box and be quite, um, you know, visionary and try to propose uh, solutions that break the rules a little bit because a lot of the students here are um, not so quick in thinking about very unusual solutions uh, in the way that, you know, the, um, yeah, the cities just shows all these constraints. So in that sense, it's, it's an interesting collaboration and hopefully win-win situation. Yes. Um, of course, now, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Yes, um, this is a very good question because I wish I could do a lecture about that, but I don't have enough work yet. Um, but in a way, this, these projects that I showed, of course, are a little bit older already. And um, what I'm 
personally very interested in is moving from away from generative design to a much more um, data-driven approach, uh, exploring um, processes to analyze what's really happening in the city without making a sort of assumptions uh, or even thinking about uh, a fixed solution, but maybe something that is much more in ongoing uh, feedback loop as something that's, that becomes a, um, almost like a, a responsive city, as I put in the lecture or some other people have called it the, the conscious city, right? The, the idea that cities are aware of changes to movements and activity levels uh, by the people within the city. And then uh, they're responding with the way uh, certain services are provided or certain spaces are being managed. Um, so uh, I didn't put that in this lecture because all of the videos that I'm collecting currently and uh, some of the testing that we're doing um, are um, not yet finished and or, or done by others such as you know M MIT um, or in Singapore um, but we are currently working towards this in Hong Kong as well to have a sort of an urban analytics uh, group of people that are using uh, the big data available in the city from the city from the users um, to start to try and map out patterns of ever use uh, understanding what different demographics, uh, different types of people are doing on an everyday basis, how their movement patterns are, how their activity um, patterns are, uh, how where they interact uh, in a social capacity. So, and, and can we then start to compare uh, certain aspects of urban form with those real um, analysis of the real data from the city and therefore understand which configurations of urban form really work, uh, which configurations of public spaces are actually preferred by the real um, people, not based on the assumption of the designer, but by showing and understanding the real use of, of uh, people and how they sort of in instinctively and intuitively respond to the atmosphere and the quality of space in those places. So this is a much bigger topic, of course, and um, there's many people working on this, but uh, personally, this is what I'm most interested in and uh, working towards for the next couple of years. It's, it's a um, very difficult question. And the way I would tackle it is uh, in, in a way similar to some of the wording I put already in the lecture, where uh, in my view, architects and urban designers should be more like um, process designers rather than product designers. Um, even you could think of architecture or uh, urban design uh, such as master planning in a way uh, as something that should be more thought around as a service than as a fixed finished product, right? It becomes much more easy to harvest data about the actual use. So we don't have to make so many assumptions. Um, 
I'm not advocating a sort of a automatic process at all, but I am very interested in having semi-automatic processes of translation from the data into the design um, or, or management solutions. But um, I think we even need more architects and urban designers to critically reflect and sort of shape these processes of interpretation to make sure that it doesn't become a sort of um, machinic scenario that is, is only geared towards uh, efficiency or, or, or reducing costs, but we can start to embed certain um, objectives into the system. So I'm very interested in the, the term smart cities because I think it's very overused and misinterpreted, just like smartphones are really not doing anything intelligent, but they're just a, a series of tools that they do reshape the way we socialize and things like that. But the phone itself is not smart, right? It, it makes people more connected and more mobile in, in a way. So um, I'm hoping that smart cities could be a way for designers to rethink how cities are also becoming more flexible and allowing the citizens to be more mobile and, and more uh, to have more agency rather than um, seeing cities just as a collection of objects where um, the citizens are the sort of consumers within that, right? But maybe these kind of smart uh, management and design systems can give them more control um, to, like I said uh, several times, to uh, appropriate spaces, to choose what kind of activities and services are there, um, to really shape cities around the demands rather than from the supply side to try you know, to push certain commercial services, but to rather empower communities to choose how they want services in their neighborhood that um, support their um, real demands or their quality of living as a community. Huh. Wait, I didn't see the chat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your question. Yeah. Um, this is absolutely the potential and uh, was already in that project, the idea that um, all the road markings are gone and you just have a shared surface where pedestrians share with maybe bicyclists or mobility scooters or self-driving vehicles that um, especially in the city centers, right? Um, they are allowed, but at certain maximum amounts and with certain maximum speeds and also a certain security protocol to give priority uh, to pedestrians, just like you see already in Exhibition Road in London, for instance, or other shared surfaces. Um, and then I think that the um, exciting bit is to imagine what these uh, vehicles are going to be and whether they can actually be part of the urban landscape, just like, um, you know, markets are a kind of a temporary village, right? Maybe really depending on supply and demand, just like you see, you know, swarms of Uber drivers descending on nightlife districts at the time that the bars are closing, right? You, you can imagine that if um, people getting up in the morning, uh, the breakfast uh, food trolleys are kind of swarming around the housing projects and you can pick up your donut or your bagel uh, and maybe also get a ride to the train station. Uh, 
uh, for your regional transportation. Um, so you can start to combine these experiences rather than seeing travel as a necessary uh, block of time that is sort of slots into your daily routine that can now be also a meeting or a, a shared meal or even a bit more uh, relaxing and resting. And, and just understanding that many people are doing this at the same time and, and also more exciting to have a range of choices. Uh, to see, you know, different kind of food trucks, for instance, popping up for lunch. You have all those different foods to choose from or um, different options for different payment uh, price levels. If you want to travel privately uh, or you want to save some money and, and go with eight or 16 people in a little sort of bus type thing, right? Um, and then um, maybe have a nice chat as well with some strangers. <laughs> depending on your mood. So yeah. this is going to reshuffle a lot of um, things we currently for take for granted or, or see as separated issues. Uh, there may be a dark side, you know, a commercial interest moving in and advertising and, and things, you know, McDonald's may be always in front of your door in the morning uh, offering a ride for free as long as you buy their breakfast, right? Um, so there has to be some kind of oversight and, and critical thinking from urban designers as well to not make this uh, just a completely um, market driven spectacle as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that that is a definitely very interesting and th thought provoking vision, um, especially the the analogy or metaphor of a flock of Uber, flying Uber taxis flying in uh, at night, like flock of pigeons sounds really interesting. Right. Uh, something that would, yeah, <laughs> that'd be crazy to see. Uh, that also uh, like, and then I, I, I'm starting to, maybe this sounds like a daydream, but now I'm starting to speculate even further where, um, where I was reading about Tesla's vision of automated driving and how they speculate that when all the vehicles on the road are uh, automated, basically there is no such thing as traffic or turn signals because they are fully coordinated with each other. And so it will be more like uh, a blood vessel where we see cells flowing through and vehicles and people will be moving through like that. And now with this la another layer of um, vision where we see a grid of sensors overlaid on top of the, the city uh, infrastructure so that, you know, roads themselves can be, it doesn't have to be fixed anymore. It's, it's such a, such an interesting vision. Yeah. Yes. And we already have the sensors, right? You have it in your pocket. So you don't even need sensors in the, in the road uh, because, um, you know, every human, in a way, is a is a sort of uh, augmented sensor, right? It's it's um, their their eyes, their ears, uh, smell, etc. Plus the the digital uh, surfaces, uh, information that we all receive and and feedback to others around us. Um, so it's it's definitely already happening. Uh, you know, like in um, in Holland, the highways, the maximum speed is adjusting based on the traffic volume automatically, right, to try and control the density of vehicles and therefore uh, the capacity of the roads to try avoid traffic jams. Um, so it's only a matter of time uh, until we see this in public spaces as well, maybe, um, you know, like in um, UCL, the library, you can see which study places uh, the chairs are occupied. So you can book a desk, um, which is empty because there's no body sitting on it. Uh, of course, again, <laughs> Sumin uh, put in the text, um, this is very appropriate topic for Black Mirror, <laughs> thinking about the, the negative consequences potentially of these kind of systems of surveillance, right? And that's why it's so important to have urban designers and architects imagine these scenarios rather than companies like Google or, or, or Sony Ericsson or, or whoever, um, Samsung, I don't know. Uh, a lot of the smart city uh, systems are, are currently being developed by companies who just want to sell technology and products, right? But it, it may lead to um, the wrong kind of uh, management systems that is not really in the interest of 
the, the users are more in the interest of the electricity companies or the uh, insurance companies or whatever. So yeah, we, we have to be very critical, just like uh, Rem Kohlhaas, when you read his uh, talks about the smart city, is, is very critical about it and um, feels that it's, it's too much power in the hands of the technology providers. Um, and we have to be careful, just like you see the debate about uh, social media being a platform that is great, but also it, it brings new problems, right, about um, social uh, misuse, let's say, in the way that people communicate with each other. So the same way, if, if we overlap, overlay these systems into the city, there's new questions about um, whether that should be part of completely free and open system or there should be forms of regulation. Hmm. Yes. Uh, again, I have to give credit to my student, uh, George, who um, worked uh, a lot on this topic and uh, also inspired me a lot with this project. Um, he found, for instance, that um, there's a type of self-driving car uh, platform which uh, imagines that the drivetrain and the batteries is separate from the capsule that goes on top. Um, so when you run out of battery, you don't need to lose the whole vehicle for recharging, but you just uh, take out the drivetrain and then you swap that out. Just like a, a power drill, um, you can swap out the battery pack. Um, so that sounds great, but actually that would create a lot more uh, need for infrastructure, uh, almost like a sort of a new parking system for those vehicles. Um, so, and George actually imagined that they could be in the vertical towers, just like some of those automated car uh, storage systems, which, you know, automatically plug in the cars into a sort of a rack for storage. Um, and he, he drew them into his projects uh, to save space, obviously, uh, to free up the land, um, but also uh, because um, it, it only works if those uh, storage for uh, self-driving vehicles or charging points, let's say, are, are very closely distributed to the places of demand. Otherwise, you still get a lot of congestion uh, of having cars drive to the periphery and back. What happens with parking lots, um, you, you, they theoretically could all be freed up, right? If there's no more private ownership, but just, uh, you know, different levels of basic to luxury rental. Um, um, it's, it's the same question as, you know, who owns the city and, and what is the tension between uh, public and private um, investments in, in the development of the city. Uh, in LA, it's very difficult to imagine that the government would step in and buy a lot of the parking lots to turn them into public spaces, right? So the danger might be that if um, owners of the lands can no longer make money with using them as parking lots, they will just start developing them and uh, the result would be less amount of open public spaces in the city um, unless there's either another commercial reason uh, to think of um, um, developers using public space or privately owned public space like you see for instance in Hong Kong in front of shopping malls um, certain shopping malls uh, they have privately owned uh, plazas um, just to create a sort of um, uh, additional attraction to bring people into the mall um, or there would have to be some sort of scenario where the, the role of the government is, is expanded, right, to, to operate more um, public spaces than they currently do, uh, which is a different discussion uh, and, and more difficult to imagine. Uh, but it's very interesting what would happen with all those 
parking lots and whether they can turn into um, real public spaces which are owned by the public and where the public can decide what happens there or you know they could maybe be owned by the self-driving car companies to either store their vehicles or uh, have some kind of interaction between people and the vehicles on that on that land right Yes, um, that's a very interesting and very complicated question <laughs> uh, about a very complex issue that, that covers a range of topics. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, as you've seen in the lecture, uh, the idea of flexibility, openness, uh, open-endedness, and the right of people to use public space in a way that suits their needs rather than for instance, um, controlling too much uh, the type of activities uh, through regulations and CCTV and management. Um, I think uh, good, let's say, um, healthy cities have a mixture of a range of uh, different types of public spaces, right? Some are more uh, under control and more centralized. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, even some uh, privately owned public spaces can give a real benefit to the city. Um, but for instance, if you look in Hong Kong, there's also a very interesting set of informal public spaces that are actually not officially public spaces, but they're kind of leftover spaces like um, the space under viaducts or um, one very popular place is um, industrial site, which is a pier, uh, which is used for container storage and things like that. Um, but it's very popular with people to go uh, walking with their dogs or exercising or take photo shoots. And therefore the nickname is the Instagram pier uh, because all those shipping containers give really beautiful backgrounds for photo shoots. Um, so the, the, the informality is a, is a certain quality that uh, I think healthy cities need. And uh, maybe that's why I, Hong Kong, uh, uh, the space, even the, the, that Instagram peer is officially not allowed to go there, but it's, it's still allowed somehow, right? Um, it's not too heavily policed um, as long as uh, people stay safe there. Um, so those, especially when these, a lot of these smaller spaces are uh, distributed across different neighborhoods, right? They, they then become also very important um, mechanisms for groups, for instance, of different culture to organize themselves. Um, the link to surveillance or data or communication technologies, of course, is difficult because that's maybe not so much related to the spaces per se. Uh, it's more about maybe different groups using different apps to communicate or in different languages. Um, so it's, it's almost like two separate issues. But of course, if both are allowed to exist and uh, being properly used, then you can imagine that um, there are more opportunities for people to organize and find each other. And then within the very busy and, and competitive cityscape uh, carve out small pockets of space where they are 
they're free to just enjoy each other's company or express their cultural identity, right? Which uh, is, is in a way part of healthy society to set up these kind of dialogues between subgroups of society. For instance, in Hong Kong, it's very nice to actually see um, the domestic workers uh, have unique cultures, like, uh, whether they're from Philippines or Indonesia, or um, and then they have certain types of food and music and the way uh, to dress or even dance in the public spaces. Um, and uh, this could could be more supported, right? Uh, rather than just letting them squeeze on um, on a few sidewalks here and there that are left over, um, they could be more supported with, uh, for instance, places that are shaded in the summer uh, because it's very hot uh, and, and humid here. Uh, or providing, for instance, public toilets in the right places, which are very vital um, part of infrastructure as well. So um, one way is, is about the, the sort of management philosophy or, or even the, the, you know, the deliberate reduction of management of certain spaces. And then the other um, is just to sort of welcome um, different cultures to be part of the exciting mixture of, of people and, and of all kind of backgrounds and, and um, cultures that the interesting cities have, right? Maybe I'll leave this. I can talk a lot more about this issue, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, Right. Yeah. I'm uh, m mostly on Instagram now, um, which you may have tagged me already for the lecture. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I can share with you. Share with your students. Yeah. My name is uh, Yeroon Urban Systems. <laughs> Sure, no problem. It's really nice to be with you guys and thanks for the questions and the interesting discussion afterwards. And I wish you guys all the best of luck with a very interesting visiting school that uh, Sumin set up. I'm sure it will be. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.